Yes. L Lord Reid, just still on the I issue of Treasury involvement and the Treasury's attitude, a at the time at which you'd had the meeting with Mr Boateng, which was referred to in the letter we looked at, you, you hadn't, as I understand it, um, put together a worked-up bid for Treasury Reserve funds um, or a worked-up bid uh, setting out the case um, um, for, for the uh, expenditure t to the Treasury um, in, in any particular form. Was, was it unusual for the Treasury to say no, you know, d don't take it any further before having received more detailed information? Um, I can't really opine on that because I, I can't recall having gone on any other occasion <clears throat> and, and made a bid that was uh, uh, not only outside the budget review that had taken place, but was a, was a complete reversal of, of government policy on an issue which had been sustained for a number of years. So I think there may be an element of, of financial consideration from the Treasury's point of view, but also maybe a, a worry on terms of precedent uh, from their point of view, which, which incidentally I can understand. I mean, it is the reality of government that the Treasury is there to uh, watch the taxpayers' money. Um, and if, you know, we, we all, when I say we, I mean secretaries of state, if we had our way on, on everything we wanted to do, it, it would be unaffordable. So, I, I, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with the Treasury, but it's also the job of, of the Secretary of State to argue for what they think is justifiable. Um, and just to complete the, the documentary picture, there's a response from a financial official within the department um, to Mr. Boateng's letter, a response addressed to you, at DHSC 0004421 underscore 079. Um, it's dated the 28th of August 2003, uh, so it's the day, I think, after the Chief Secretary's letter and the day before your, um, the press announcement. And it refers in the first letter to the, the, the chief secretary, sorry, the first paragraph to the chief secretary's letter. Then says paragraph two: I'm content that the costs and risks are manageable, and in particular, the scheme does not create a precedent that will create liability for similar future claims. Paragraph three explains that we will be able to absorb the costs of the proposed scheme within current DH budgets, uh, and, and then. Four and five deals with the issue of the, the timing of the announcement and, and, and which year's budgets, which I, I won't um, go over. Uh, and then, uh, under the heading creating a precedent, Mr. Campbell, the author of this minute, says, I do not believe that setting up a compensation scheme for hepatitis C sufferers will create a precedent for future campaigns on similar issues for two reasons. The payments we will, we will be making will be ex gratia and therefore we will not be admitting any liability. <laughs> Secondly, we have already set up two similar schemes, the Macmillan and Eileen Trusts, to compensate patients who contracted HIV through infected blood products, which created no precedent. Um, did, did it um, occur to you to perhaps go back to the Treasury, whether at this stage or, in, or some, at some point in the future, with this assurance from within your own department that it didn't have the precedent-setting risks that Mr Boateng had been have been worried about and, and to see whether you could get perhaps a, a more responsive attitude from the Treasury? Uh, well, one comment on this is dated the 28th. Uh, I can't remember if I actually saw this, but if I did, it would have come as something of a relief uh, to me because, of course, we were scheduled to make the announcement the next day. And similarly, the, the very next day, the day of the announcement, came the legal advice from you know, the, uh, the government's legal advisers that it didn't create precedent. I believed this all along, but, um, but it made it difficult um, not knowing until the last moment. It, there was a certain tension about it that, that my position had a, a formal backing. As regards your specific question, uh, no, I didn't go back to the Treasury. First of all, 
I don't think they would have accepted our departmental legal advice. They would have taken their own. But secondly, if you read the letters from the Treasury and the correspondence surrounding it, it wasn't just a matter of legal precedence. It was the matter of whether this created a cascading effect where other groups would now claim it. So there was, a, if you like, a political and social element to their uh, anxiety as well as just a financial one. Um, and um, did it, is this an issue as far as you can recall that you discussed with the Prime Minister? And, and, but, but just before I, I invite you to answer that, we've heard evidence in relation to um, uh, the establishment of schemes in the 90s that the involvement of the Prime Minister was uh, uh, valuable in, in bringing the Treasury round. Yeah. Um, did, did, did it occur to you to perhaps try and involve the Prime Minister? Did, did you do so? You know, it's a very good question. I have no recollection. That may sound absurd to people who, you know, have never worked that closely um, in government with a Prime Minister. That you can't remember whether you spoke to the Prime Minister about this or not. But, I mean, I had numerous discussions with the Prime Minister in every position that I held. By, I, I suspect I didn't, for this reason, that particularly from my time in Northern Ireland onwards, uh, Prime Minister Blair tended to let me get on with things and just report to him if I had a particular problem. Um, so that he, he, he didn't, you know, oversee everything that I was doing. So I suspect I didn't. Uh, I didn't approach the Chancellor either uh, because, among other things, I assumed, perhaps wrongly, that if the Chief Secretary was taking a position on an issue like this, which involved the Scottish Parliament, then the Chancellor knew about it. Uh, that was my assumption. The Chief Secretary wasn't saying anything to me that the Chancellor wouldn't know about, at the very least. I'm not saying the Chancellor would have set the line, but um, that would be their final position. And, uh, you know, we could speculate, but it's sheer speculation that either the Prime Minister or indeed the Chancellor, despite the reluctance of the Treasury, said, OK, let them go ahead, but make the conditions tough. But that is sheer speculation. Do you recall any other occasions, whether at the Department of Health um, uh, or in any of the other departments that, that you were at, where you went to the Treasury um, uh, for uh, consent to spend money in a different way or, or, or try to, to get additional funding, um, and, and in which the Prime Minister or the Chancellor were involved? Oh... Um. I can remember discussions with the Prime Minister, the Chancellor and the Chief Secretary, not all on the same subject, over a period of years about expenditure. I can't off the top of my head say, yes, I went for extra money for, for X. Um, I'm afraid I would have to you know, think about that. Okay. Understood. Um, can I then just turn back to the the significance of the Scottish prior announcement for, for the decision you took. And, and just first of all, go to something you say in your statement, and then there's a document I want to show you because there's a question I've been asked to ask you arising out of it. Okay. So in your statement, WITN 0793001, um, starting at page 18, There is a heading just above paragraph 8.35, Scottish influence on decision making. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to read through all of the following no. paragraphs. You, you discuss it and, and you, you, you've addressed it already in your oral evidence. But, but Lawrence, if we could go to page 20. I just want to read aloud paragraphs 8.41 to 8.43. Um, you say there, these examples, and you'd given earlier ex examples about uh, yeah. aspects in which you, you'd taken a different course from Scotland, 
demonstrate that there was scope for divergence of health policies, including ones relating to the financing of support or treatment between the two nations. The important point is that on this question of infected blood financial assistance, it is my recollection that I believe the initiative taken in Scotland was the right one and one that should be available to those infected those affected in England, indeed preferably throughout the UK, and I believe the documentation speaks to that. The Scottish initiative did have an impact on the timetabling of the English decision, see the events of late August, which we've already discussed. It provided impetus, though even after we had embarked on the UK-wide scheme, I still tried to expedite its implementation. It provided a ready-made template for England and the other devolved institutions. It may also have added leverage to my own case for change against resistance from, e.g., HMT. I have no hesitation in giving credit to the Scottish Executive for their initiative. Nevertheless, the decision to introduce an English scheme was a positive one, taken primarily because I considered that it was the appropriate thing to do. I would not have pursued it simply to achieve unity of policy with Scotland. The inquiry has suggested that it might be said that the DH was forced into accepting a scheme because Scotland had decided to do so. I have set out my comments on this issue above. I do not think that it is a complete, accurate or fair representation of the reasons for the actions that I took. Does, does that reflect your evidence today? Well, it's for others to judge. I think it does, yes. And then, can I ask you to look at one document um, at DHSC... 5325041. Now, this is from Mr. Gotowski to you, 12th of September 2003. Um, uh, if we could just look at paragraph three, please. Um, so, the first part of that refers to Mr. Chisholm's appearance before the Scottish Health Committee on the 9th of September. Yeah and says it was this appearance which in part precipitated your announcement of the scheme on the 29th of August. Yeah. And is it right to understand that last sentence as, as referring um, to the timing of the announcement rather than the decision in principle to have a scheme? That's my understanding of it, yes. I mean, as we've discussed, Malcolm was due to speak at the Scottish oh, Health Committee on, I think, the 9th of September, um, and therefore, I think I said earlier in my evidence, that's what pushed us to do things so quickly. Um, uh, it precipitated the announcement being made on the 29th of August. Um, and then it, it continues, during the course of his appearance, Malcolm Chisholm reconfirmed that the payments could be as he had originally announced back in January, i.e. £20,000 to those infected with hepatitis C as a result of treatment with NHS blood, and a further £25,000 payable if a person's condition advances to a medically defined trigger point. These are the levels of payment we've based our cost calculations on. He also confirmed that there would be no payments to dependents, which again is a position we adopt, although we've not made any public statements to that effect. And the question I'm asked to, to explore with you, Lord Reid, is this. That, that reference there to, to this being, again, a position we adopt, the suggestion is that... that in terms of the parameters of the scheme at least, it is the Scottish tail wagging the English dog. Uh, do you have any comment on that? I wouldn't use that phrase, um, although some people would. The way some people in Scotland uh, declared it because we were doing it in partnership with Scotland, some people in the extremes in Scotland talked about the Westminster controlled scheme. Um, there, there were some people on both sides of this who were a mirror image of each other. Um, so, I mean, I, I have no hesitation, as I said in my statement, of crediting Scotland with bringing up this initiative or of saying that it was uh, a template that we could use, uh, that it was the right decision it wasn't a perfect one because, as we'll come on to no doubt, there were elements that neither of us could afford, neither Scotland nor Britain. Um, but we essentially adopted their scheme as, as a template, yes. But I don't... I mean, I think tails wagging dogs and Westminster controlling Scotland are, are phrases that are inimical 
to me, to devolution, the, the respectful um, acceptance that each of the governments have their own areas. Neither should do something just because the other's doing it, but nor should they say we're not doing it because the other one's doing it if what they're doing is the right thing. I think it's just common sense in my view. Um, we can take that down, thank you. Now, as I understand the documents and your, your statement, Lord Reid, having had that fairly intensive involvement with the decision-making between coming into office in June and the announcement at the end of August 2003, you then had some ongoing involvement with decisions about the broad parameters of the scheme, leading to an announcement um, of the scheme set up in January 2004, and then you had little involvement with further issues relating to the precise development of the scheme in the course of 2004. Is that right? That's right. That's, you know, it's the role of the Secretary of State to show leadership, um, hopefully a bit of vision, strategic analysis, sense of direction, and on a policy like this, the principal policy decision. Thereafter, your ministers have the responsibility for implementing the direction of that and beneath them the officials, the operational details of it. So I just want to ask you a handful of questions now about the, the document, documentation between October 2003 and January 2004 whilst you were okay. giving your approval to some decisions about the broad parameters of yes. the scheme uh, and then come back to, to some of what, what was left out of the scheme. Okay. Um, so if we go to DHSC 0016672, please. Um, we're now in October 2003. This is a minute from Mr Kotowski to you, 3rd of October 2003, the purpose of which in paragraph one is to update you with progress on setting up the scheme and to seek your agreement on the various component parts. Paragraph 2 records that you'd expressed a wish that the announcement of the parameters of the scheme is made quickly. Um, and then paragraph 3 refers to the press statement and then says, since the announcement, we've been working to put together the parameters of the scheme and significant progress has been made. I if we pick it up then under the heading parameters of the scheme, paragraph 4 explains, we met with colleagues in the devolved administrations and agreed that the scheme should be identical to that proposed by Scotland i.e. initial payment of 20k plus an additional 25k on reaching a medically defined trigger point. Payments only to those alive when the scheme was announced on the 29th of August and who have not cleared the virus spontaneously. Within the basic criteria, there are a number of exceptions and variations. These are listed at Annex A. Um, and a medically defined trigger, there's then a, 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 um, a, a, a discussion there and reference about six lines down to being in the process of setting up a small meeting with liver specialists. If we go over the page, I don't need to read out, I think paragraph six deals with who's going to administer the scheme. Paragraph seven deals with some matters relating to Wales and, and social security disregard. Paragraph eight then says this, any announcement will clearly generate a degree of reaction from patients particularly at the level of the payments we envisage and the fact that there will be no payment to dependents, the Haemophilia Society have already stated that they could not accept a scheme which contained the above elements and that they would want discussions on the detail of the scheme before any final decisions were made. Given the warm welcome to the announcement we received in Parliament, we thought it would be a good idea to invite the Society to the meeting we intend having with the Trust. I realise that you've expressed reservations about involving pressure groups in such discussions, but in this case, it could prevent some criticism when the announcement is finally made. Are you happy for us to have such a, a meeting? J j just on that last point, yeah. do, do you have any recollection of, of the, the, these reservations that you are said to have expressed about involving pressure groups? Um, I have recollections, but that doesn't actually represent my view. I never had a problem meeting uh, or having my ministers meet um, the Haemophilia Society. What I, what I was conscious of is that if we extended at this stage not only consultation with the Haemophilia Society 
but to all of the subgroups who had, many of them split off from the Haemophilia Society. I mean, like, like all campaigning groups, there are people within it who take a, a more extreme or a less extreme view and so on. So the Haemophilia Society, I think from memory, and I will stand corrected, um, the Manor House Group was a split off from it. And then the Haemophilia Action Group was a split off from the Manor House Group. And then the Scottish Haemophilia Action Group was, and, and the Scottish Haemophilia Forum, these were all split offs. And so what I was, if you're already dealing with all the government departments and four devolved administrations and a parliamentary group and, and Alf Morris, you know, and the Lords, I was perfectly happy, my recollection is, to meet, uh, to, to have the Haemophilia Society involved, but I didn't want every single split off lobbyist group involved in that because that was a recipe for for just general argumentation, which would undermine the cohesiveness of what we're trying to do and the speed of it. And that, that's my view. And I think this is a shorthand, shorthand for that. Um, are you happy for us to have such a meeting with the Haemophilia Society? I don't know if there's a document saying I said yes, but I obviously did say yes because <coughs> Melanie, excuse me, Melanie Johnson, I think, met with them more than once. And certainly, we continued the correspondence. So I'm glad to get the chance to clarify what that means. And then if we go to the next page, we can see Mr. Gutowski asks in paragraph 10 uh, for your agreement on the criteria of the scheme plus the exceptions um, and variations and, uh, and also agreement to meeting and so on. And then if we go over the page... Can, can, we just yes, go can you just course. go back there? Yeah. Yes, he's asking to, to meet with, with the Haemophila Society. Yeah, and I think I agreed that. Um, I, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll look at that in a moment. Um, if we just go over the page, I, I'm not going to read th this, this out, but the, the, this again sets some certain parameters in relation to the hepatitis C screen, uh, scheme. Um, and there's reference um, to, for example, in paragraph seven, undertaking not to institute further legal proceedings yeah. and so on. And some of, the, some of these parameters changed, but I'm not going to go into the detail some of that. Some of them changed. In my view, for the better, um, this, at this stage, this level of, of uh, who, who could engage, who was excluded and so on, would have been dealt with mainly by Melanie Johnson, and I would have been asked to OK her findings or not. And, and if we go to... DHSC 5326827. The response at the bottom of the page from Sammy Sinclair on your behalf was to say, um, thank you very much for this note. Secretary of State has seen it and is happy with the suggestions you give, including in Annex A. Um, now, um, at, at, at that point in time, do you recall whether you gave much by way of independent consideration to the parameters that were proposed? Um, or, or was it very much a question of, well, this is what my officials are recommending and I'm content to go along with it? No, it was a matter of relying on the judgment of Melanie, Melanie Johnson. Um, there may have been, I can't think off the top of my head, occasions when I asked for a review of you know, what she was recommending. But by and large, she was entrusted with carrying out this level of detail and to quiz, quiz or question the officials beneath her um, on anything that she didn't think was acceptable. But this is, this is beyond the stage of setting the direction and, and uh, setting up the scheme. This is getting down into the nitty gritty of it. And, and I would have relied increasingly on her judgment on these matters. And, and there were two documents from Melanie Johnson, two notes she sent to you then a couple of months later, December 2003. Um, if we can look at those in turn, 
DHSC 5977636. Uh, um, so this is um, from Melanie Johnson to John Reed, 3rd of December 2003. She recalled she's met with Michael Connerty, who was, I think, chair of the all-party parliamentary group on haemophilia at that point in time. He was the MP from memory for Falkirk East who was chair of the all-party parliamentary group, which is a House of Commons group. He tended to be the person that I would look to in, in the House of Commons, uh, and Alf was the person that you would look to in the House of Lords. Uh, so we can see that Ms Johnson's met with Mr Connerty, met with the Haemophilia Society, and there are three major concerns being, being raised. They're fleshed out in correspondence yeah. that, that I don't think we'll need to look at. Um, the exclusion of dependents of those who died um, uh, and then no payments to those co-infected, no payments to those who cleared the hepatitis C virus following treatment. Um, and as I understand it, again, I don't think we'll need to trace through the details. Changes were made in relation to those second two points, but in relation to the first, the scheme as announced in due course a month or so after this, continued to make no payments to those, the dependents of those who died. That's right. Paragraph two illustrates the point I was just making about relying on Melanie Johnson. After her discussions, she went back and tasked officials to go back and see if they could do better. Um, and they came back saying that they could do, they could address questions two and questions three which uh, incorporated two other classes of people, the eligible people, uh, which I subsequently okayed. And to my everlasting regret, uh, regret that we couldn't find a way of including uh, the first category, which is dependence. And if we just look at paragraph four of this, the explanation Ms Johnson gives for that is the cost of including dependents in the scheme is prohibitively expensive. So I suggest no concession here. Um, you said that's to your everlasting regret a moment ago. Um, why is that? Because I would like to have done it. Um, because it was done, uh, by and large, for HIV dependents. And if I had been able to find the money, I would have tried to have a scheme for Hep C that was similar to HIV. That was one of my initial um, feelings about it. it. Would it be right to understand then that you, from your perspective, um, you understood and accepted the case, the, the moral case, if one wants to put it that way, for the inclusion of, of dependents? But it was a simple case of not having the funding available from the departmental budget. Well, I, I don't know if it's anywhere in the documentation, and I'm working on my memory, but the, uh, the, to the best of my recollection, yes, it was a matter of regret for me. I mean, basically, the, the, the ballpark figures, as I understood them, were the Scottish scheme, £200 million, pounds, to include dependents, £400 million, to uh, achieve the uh, sort of sums and arrangements argued by Lord Ross, uh, £600 million. And we had difficulty in getting even the £200 million under pretty stringent conditions from the Treasury. Um, and therefore, it, it, it was one of these, and it's not the only one that I've come across in government where, where you if you had the money, you would do something. And if you didn't have it, you would regret the fact that you couldn't do it, but it was a reality of life, given the budget. Um, you said before the break, uh, uh, this isn't a precise quote from you, but words to the effect that um, you were keen to at least get something up and running in terms of a scheme, yeah. and then it could always be extended later on, that it was easier perhaps to extend it once you've, you've got something in place. Yes. Does it follow from that that you would have expected this issue of um, 
making payments only to those who were alive when the scheme was announced um, and, the, and the exclusion of dependents to be something that was actively kept under review by the department and by, by your successors? I don't want to say anything that reflects in any way on my successors. So I, uh, I, I will curtail my comments to, I think it, it was my anticipation that in the next spending round, which came, I think, unfortunately, just when I was moved to defence, that it might be possible, not the next year, because the Treasury had, you know, we had signed up to not apply for it, but the next spending round, I think I anticipated that had I still been there, that I would have at least made a bid for uh, the monies that would have covered the initial scheme. Had that been the case, of course, it would also have been possible to go further with a bid. But these are, these are my recollections now of what would be incoherent thoughts there. It wasn't a plan. It wasn't something that I expected, but it's something that I thought might be possible in the future. Unfortunately, what was the case was that it wasn't possible in the present for reasons that we've <coughs> just gone through. Um, and, and I don't think I need to go to the second note um, produced by Ms Johnson, but again, for the benefit of the transcript, uh, it is DHSC 5080604. Um, it, it's a more detailed document. Um, but it also says that in relation to dependence, that was unsustainable on grounds of affordability. So it's consistent, I think, with what was set out in the document we've just looked at. Um, can I then ask you to look at DHSC 0004555 underscore 132? Um, this is um, a minute, a further minute from Mr. Kutowski to you, dated the 6th of January 2004. Um, uh, uh, and it's headed Hepatitis C Financial Assistance Scheme Announcement of Details. The four health departments are now all in a position to announce the basic eligibility criteria and payment structure of the Hepatitis C Financial Assistance Scheme. We ask that you reconfirm the details of the scheme, note the outstanding issues, agree the proposed name, and agree the handling strategy to announce these details. Now, there are just two points I want to ask you about in relation to this, Lord Reid. The first is over the page under the heading funding. So it's the second paragraph. Um, formal discussions of how the new scheme will be jointly funded by the four administrations have not yet begun. Each administration has already identified funds, however. Um, just, can you assist us in understanding that, that what's meant by that first sentence? Um, I mean, presumably all four administrations had an idea of what they were going to have to spend and, yes. and, and, had, and had found the funds for it, as, as the second um, sentence suggests. What, what was envisaged by way of future discussions? Do you know? Um. I take it what that means. Well, the scheme was going to be, the scheme was going to be administered originally. It was thought by the McFarland Trust for reasons that we haven't covered, but they were essentially legal. Uh, the trust couldn't do it as the primary body. Therefore, it had to be a subsidiary trust, which is the Skipton, and that because because of regulations concerning uh, taxation and so on, it had to be a legal limited company. Um, now, that was therefore entrusted with administering the monies of financial assistance, but of course the monies had to come into it, primarily from the Department of Health, but also from Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And I think the first sentence um, is in relationship to how that would actually work. How would they pay? I think that's the case. 
to the mechanics of what would be paid by which administration to the Skipton when, essentially. And how it was paid, exactly. Um, if we then go back to the first page, please, the penultimate paragraph, medical trigger, there's reference there to a, the group of experts advising the Department of Health on the trigger point yeah. for the payment of the second lump sum um, uh, and, and reference to the group meeting again to finalise um, it, it, its recommendations. Um, can, can I ask you to look, um, bearing, bearing that in mind, at, at a meeting, a set of minutes for a meeting of, of this group, SCGV, Four zero two six five underscore zero zero four. This is an example of, of um, a set of minutes. We can see it's headed meeting to discuss the medical trigger point for the proposed higher payment, fourteenth of October two thousand and three. There are a number of uh, people present, a number of profess professors, and there are then various representatives. Um, including from the Department of Health. Um, did you have any involvement with this group, with identifying who should sit on the group, or, or any involvement in considering the detail of their discussions? No, this is... Uh, thank you for sending me this, incidentally. I think about 36 hours ago I got this, and I, I frankly couldn't work out why you had sent this and talk, you know, I've received thousands of documents and I thought, well, I wonder why I've been sent this. Now I know. Um, look, this was at a level of medical expertise that was way above my knowledge. Um, I mean, it was, it was a, a technical detail, which I probably wouldn't have covered anyway, even if I had understood that half of, of what these charts were discussing, um, but the, the reality is I couldn't, these, these were top experts uh, who were discussing whether or not and in what, what fashion there could be a trigger point that wasn't simply cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, and it was way above my, my knowledge. So I wouldn't be involved, uh, Ms. Richards. So you would have understood that those discussions were going on yes. involving the department and the group, but th yes. that, that's essentially it. I would have understood they were going on, and I would have expected Melanie Johnson to oversee them, but not to participate in them. But her officials and her clinical uh, advisors would be part of this group. I don't know exactly who was there. Paul is, David Ray was there, and he would be reporting to, to, uh, to Melanie Johnson. Um, again, just to complete the chronology uh, in terms of your involvement, um, if we look at WITN 0793006. This is a letter addressed to you um, dated the 6th of January 2004. Um, it's signed by um, Mr. Connerty as chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Haemophilia, Lord Morris, um, and a number of other uh, MPs. And we can see it expresses disappointment um, uh, in uh, the first paragraph uh, about the re response that Melanie Johnson had given to essentially the concerns expressed. And then it sets out a number of um, uh, con continuing concerns about the parameters of the scheme, the first of which is this issue of the dependents, the assistance required by those who've had their family life opportunities curtailed by having to share their life with and suffer with a family member who's eventually died from hepatitis C should be included in an ex gratia assistance scheme that would never make up for the loss of a family member but might assist in creating a more stable life structure. Would it be right to understand from the answers you've already given, Lord Reid, including your expression of regret, that y you, you agree with what's being set out there in terms of the, 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 the case for providing support to those um, described in paragraph one? Yes. Look, I've already made plain that I thought we should approximate as closely as possible as we could to the agreements sorry, to the financial assistance given to patients with HIV. 
and we didn't. And the largest element of not being able to do so was the exclusion of dependents uh, of the deceased. Uh, did I say that publicly? No. What we said publicly, which was true, was that given the resources we had, we were target, targeting them upon the people who were living with suffering. And, and that's what we did. So I had considerable sympathy. And I think within a short period of this um, letter, I met with Michael Connerty and, and, and the group. Um, and I knew already that two of his three, or three of his four, I can't remember which, uh, complaints had actually, we'd managed to meet them. Uh, but I couldn't say that at the meeting because it hadn't finally been cleared through all of various channels and it was about a week and a half later we were due to make an announcement. So we were able to offer some consolation, but on the big one, which was number one, we weren't able to do it, no. And we can see the date of the meeting recorded in handwriting. You met with them on the 12th of January. Um, uh, and um, the announcement itself on the 23rd of January, I don't think we need to put it up on screen, but for the benefit of, of, of those listening, it's at WITN 0793007. And having made that announcement on the 29th of January, uh, sorry, 23rd of January, about the, the parameters of the scheme that had been agreed, you then essentially had little further involvement with the more detailed setting up of the Skipton Fund, which was in, in due course announced by Melanie Johnson in June of 2004. Is that, is that correct? Absolutely. That was a natural consequence of the division of labour within a department when it came to taking the strategic decision, which in the event was the reversal of the policy up until then, that was led by the Secretary of State. Uh, negotiations with the Treasury and with the, uh, the other various departments, DWP, the regions, the driving of the, the strategic principle nature of, of the policy, that was my responsibility. After it, working out of how we implemented this was down to Melanie Johnson, and Melanie would then rely on her officials to do the operational, and the clinical people to do the operational aspects. So after the initial stages of getting the scheme going, my involvement would, would decline. Um, now, Ms Johnson's announcement um uh, on the 3rd of June 2004, and again, we don't need to put it up on screen, I'll just read out the reference, DHSC 5066754, um, announced that um, the Skipton Fund would launch and begin processing applications on the 5th of July 2004. Correct. That's um, um, nearly a year, not quite a year, but nearly a year from the public announcement and um, around just over a year from when internally you and your ministerial colleagues had decided that a scheme would be set up. Was, was that too long? It was almost a miracle in terms of the Department of Health, I, I, I think, or any other department. I mean, to start with a reversal of a 25-year-old policy where no preparatory work has been done in the Department of Health at all, for obvious reasons that they had a different policy from the one I wanted to pursue, uh, to get agreement with other government departments, to liaise with you know, three other devolved administrations, which hadn't existed at the time the McFarlane Trust was set up and the, the Alien Trust was set up, uh, to have clarified all of the legal and legislative hurdles that were necessary in order to get a disregard for those who might receive it, to have found the finances, resolved the situation, and started an exercise in action in 10 months. I, I don't think that was by departmental standards or governmental standards. Um, I, I don't think that was um, an inordinate amount of time. Um, can I just ask you a little more in relation to the 
the levels at which the, the stage one and two payments were yeah. set. We've seen from the documents um, that they m mirrored um, what had been um, contemplated by, by, by Mr. Chisholm. Y you were aware, as I understand it at the time, and are aware now from the materials sent to you, that in Scotland there had been an expert committee report yeah. chaired by Lord Ross, which recommended substantially higher levels yes. of payment than the stage one and two payments that were eventually settled on by, by, by the Skipton Fund. Um, as far as you are aware, did you read the report of the Ross Committee? No, I didn't. Uh, nor can I remember reading the report of the Haemophilia Society. I would have been given a briefing, though I haven't seen it in the documents, I would have been given a briefing on the main conclusions of both of them uh, in the consideration of what I was trying to do. Um, and I might well have reflected on the difference between an independent report and a government department. By that, I mean that an independent report doesn't have a budget constraint on whatever they decide ought to be made in payment. And the authors of an independent report do not have to consider which group of patients will have facilities removed from them in order to pay the sums required. Um, so I, I'm that's the difference, if I might say so, between a Secretary of State and an independent report. Uh, this is not to say that an independent report doesn't have justice in, in terms of the level of payments, but it is to say that they don't have to take into account any budget constraints, and that means they don't have to take into account, well, if I'm going to pay X, Who's the why that I'm taking this from? Because I'm operating within this budget. So which group of patients are going to, you know, have a lesser contribution in terms of resources and poss possibly a lesser service in order to accomplish this? So I would have been briefed on the conclusions of those reports, but on Reflection, I wouldn't necessarily have thought that they were the same as the decision I had to make. You're comparing apples with pears, I think. You've identified in relation to the independent reports um, the factor that they don't have to take into account, namely where, where the money will come from, if I can put it that way. But would you accept that the independent reports might, however, have information and analysis within them, for example, about the actual needs of those infected and the actual suffering that was being endured and the likely future needs that the depart departmental officials might not have? I would accept that completely. And if I might say so, um, this inquiry will end up, whatever its conclusions, doing it on the basis of an in-depth study that isn't possible for a Secretary of State or a Minister to, to carry out while they're trying to function uh, and, and supervise, you know, a huge department. Um, obviously, if I don't know how long the independent report of Lord Ross took. I do know there was a preliminary report yes. and then another one. But say it took a year, a year to study, a focused study, on one particular subject is obviously going to be better informed than something which, you know, is, is undertaken in a lot less of time and a lot of debt while you're trying to deal with reducing the number of cancer deaths, the number of people who are dying from cardiovascular disease, halving the MRSA, um, reducing dramatically the number of weeks people have to wait for an election, uh, sorry, an elective operation. Um, obviously, I would accept that the database of that 
is going to be, the evidential base of that is going to be more important. What, that does not mean to say that there is no realisation among politicians and officials of these sort of issues. Uh, one of the great strengths, well, people may not think so, I think, one of the great strengths of our uh, system of producing ministers is that unlike other countries, all of our ministers are members of parliament. Most of them have a weekly surgery. And at the weekly surgery, people come to them with all sorts of different claims and, and, and different problems and different issues. So there is a sense in which, in that sense, ministers may well be better in touch with people than an independent inquiry might be, if you follow what I'm saying. I'm not talking about specifically about hepatitis C, but I'm, I'm talking about you know, whether or not ministers are, are, and, and officials are fine. Now, officials might be, but ministers are, are pretty close to the people in this country through their role as members of parliament. Um, although you didn't see and read the Ross report yourself or the Hepatitis C Working Party of the Haemophilia Society's report, <laughs> would you expect that um, within the department officials would have and should have scrutinised those reports and if they thought that there were uh, matters that needed to be brought to ministerial attention that might give rise to consideration the, of, of a greater, higher level of payment that, yeah. that they would well, have done so? Technically, no. But in practice, yes. <laughs> By that, I mean technically the Ross report was a report to the Scottish Parliament. So it wouldn't officially be something that would go to the Department of Health for the study. But officials, if they had the time, and I assume they did, um, obviously in practice would want to know what lay behind the Scottish decision, what implications it might have uh, politically and so on. So I would expect civil servants in the department to have read it. I don't know what evidence you've received from officials as to whether they did or not, but I would expect somebody working for Mr. Gutowski to at least have perused that report. Um, um, and do you recall whether either you were asked to or you yourself considered um, um, some kind of compromise between the 200 million based upon the stage one and stage two payments as, as, as announced by, by, by Mr. Chisholm and um, uh, the 600 million that was uh, estimated to be the cost of extending the scheme to, to dependents. Was I, consideration given to, to um, perhaps making a more modest payment to dependents so that at least they got something? Well, a compromise between 200 million and 600 million Correct me if I'm wrong. Is 400 million. Uh, now we couldn't afford the 200 million um, without, you know, putting our budget in terrible peril, and that was made absolutely plain to me. So we were unlikely to go above that to three or 400 million. Uh, that, I think that answers your question. That that if we wanted to target it as we were in a sense, forced to by the budget constraints on the suffering living, there wasn't a lot over for doing, you know, the, the compromise you suggested. In fact, there wasn't anything over. Can I then just ask you to look, please, at DHSC 5328495. This is... Um, uh, a, a submission from Mr. Gotowski to Ms. Johnson, uh, 10th yeah. of November 2003. I don't think there's any evidence of it being copied to your private office. But I just wanted to ask for your observations on one point in it. If we go to page 3, paragraph 12. Um, if we just look at paragraphs 11 and 12 together. So, so can we have 11 on the screen as well, please, Lawrence? So it's the top half of the page. Um, so, paragraph 11 records, as we've seen elsewhere, the outstanding concerns of the Haemophilia Society yeah. and the all-party group, and you'll see the second bullet point is that, that no payments are being made to dependents. Um, and then paragraph 12 says, um, 
um, we can accommodate the last two demands, um, that, that's the second and the third and fourth bullet points, but agreeing to the first two demands, which would be a high level of payment generally and then payment to dependents would. Um, and then there are three bullet points set out. The second is, is unaffordability, which we've already discussed. But the first is this, embarrass the Scottish executive who have already announced the size of their awards and that they will not make payments to dependents. Would the risk of embarrassment to the Scottish executive be a proper reason for not making payments that might otherwise be um, important to make as a matter of morality or fairness? First of all, can I just ask, did I ever see this? I don't believe so, no. Right, I didn't see it. Um, it was never put to me. I don't know what it means. Who wrote it? Mr. Gutowski. Right. Well, God bless Mr. Gutowski. But I, I think that's a very clumsy wording. Um, I would have put it entirely different way, and that is this, that if we were to announce, if, if my objective, as it was, was to try and encourage and work towards a coherent um, scheme which was simple, coherent, speedy, implementable, and gave equal justice to people throughout the United Kingdom, then the problem with us offering a different scheme from Scotland makes the obvious point. It would neither be simple, coherent, nor equal justice throughout the UK. But, I mean, I can honestly say not having seen this paper, but I mean, the embarrassing the Scottish executive never crossed my mind. Can I turn then um, to uh, <coughs> the issue that, that you discuss in your statement in paragraph 16 onwards? I'm, I'm not proposing currently to put it on screen, um, but it's the issue of public inquiry, whether there should be a public inquiry. Yeah. Um, and I want to um, explore that with you, first of all, by reference to a letter you wrote in April 2005, or, or, or a letter that was signed by you. It may have been drafted, of course, by officials. It's DHSC 6264733. Um, it's to um, a member of the Scottish Parliament. It, it uh, follows a meeting you'd had with him uh, on the 23rd of March, because concerns have been raised, I think, about delays in processing um, skips and fund um, applications. I'm, I'm not going to ask you about that. If we could go to the fourth paragraph of the letter, please. Um, it says this, I'm aware of pressure from some people for the government to set up a public inquiry into this issue. We have great sympathy for those infected with hepatitis C and have considered the call for an inquiry very carefully. However, as previously stated, the government does not accept that any wrongful practices were employed and does not consider that a public inquiry is justified. Donor screening for hepatitis C was introduced in the UK in 1991 and the development of this test marked a major advance in microbiological technology which could not have been implemented before this time. Um, now can I just ask you first of all about that last sentence the last sentence the, last, the sen last sentence of the penultimate paragraph? The last sentence of the penultimate yeah. paragraph, my apologies yeah. to the read. Um, the reference to donor screening for hepatitis C in 1991. Yeah. Um, this is a letter written in April 2005. Yeah. Um, in 2001, I think it was, and I might have to check uh, you're that. You're talking about the Burton case. The Burton judgment. 2001. Um, a, in the National Blood Authority, a judge yeah. of the High Court had found that screening could have been introduced yes. earlier than 1991. Yes. So it may be said that what's recorded in this letter is simply inaccurate. It not only may be said, it can be said. Um, I didn't know this at the time. I can't recall being briefed at any time about uh, the Burton decisions on this. Um, my memory may be at fault, but I just can't remember. So I would not have queried this at the time. But if you're asking me now, with what I know, courtesy of the many thousand documents you were kind enough to send me, yes, this is an inaccurate statement. 
Um, uh, then the broader question in relation to public inquiry, yeah. um, the, the reason given is the government doesn't accept that any wrongful practices um, um, were employed. Um, can I then um, I'll take you to your statement and, and see what you say about that yes. issue? So WITN 0793001, please. And it's paragraph... Um, so it's page 38. Um, uh, so um, in paragraph 16.2, you, you refer to the letter we've just looked at. In paragraph 16.3, you say the wording of that letter was based on a briefing from officials, um, and there was indeed a draft letter provided by officials. Um, and then you say um, the reasons why a public inquiry was not thought to be necessary were set out in a note from officials above, which is essentially reflects what you say in the letter. And then you say this about your own views, and this is what I wanted to ask you about. 17.2. As far as I can recollect, my own views were based on two matters. First, I was never provided with information or evidence that suggested as a minimum a prima facie case that there had been a history of fault or culpability, whether consisting of fraud, negligence, cover-up or similar. That was what I would have been looking for to consider a public inquiry, but I was not provided with evidence to that effect by officials. Second, and particularly in the absence of such a case, my focus was on providing practical help and help that could be put into place relatively quickly. And that second point, as I understand it, is a reference to what we've been discussing so far, the hepatitis C financial scheme, the Skipton. Correct. Um, so, um, uh, first of all, as a matter of fact, it is, I think, correct that you were not provided with any briefings or submissions or documents from officials um, suggesting fault or, 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 or culpability. Um, d did it occur to you to wonder whether officials might not be the best placed individuals to provide such evidence? Because if, of course there is potential for fault or culpability or criticism of the Department of Health. They may not be volunteering that to a Secretary of State, uh, um, not, not wanting yeah. there to be a public inquiry into such matters. Well, I think that's a very fair question, um, because in these matters, it's not only a conflict of interest, but as members of Parliament find out, it's the perception of a conflict of interest. And what you're suggesting, if I could put it in my words, is that it's highly unlikely that officials who may be found guilty of any of these things would be recommending to ministers that there be a public inquiry or into it. That's a fair point. But one thing that strikes me, I, I, I mean, I take it you accept, having seen all the documents that I've seen, that nobody, no officials put before me evidence of this nature. Right. Yes. Let's leave that aside. No minister, and I had some pretty robust ministers put evidence before me or a proposal before me for a public inquiry either. But the really interesting thing, Ms. Richards, which I've only realised, having gone through for a second time all of the documents I have, and I will stand corrected. I will stand corrected because, you know, like any other human being, I can make a mistake. I can't see that anybody put a proposal to me for a public inquiry. Not Alf, God rest them. Not Michael Connor in his group. Not the Haemophilia Society. And I, I've reflected on why that should be. Why is it that there's, there appear to be big demands for a public inquiry at this stage and at that stage, but, but not during my period? Now, it may well be that you can discover documents that I haven't seen or that documents I've missed, but if I'm right in my reading of, of all of this material, during that period, it just wasn't a live issue for me a public inquiry. No one was demanding it, not just officials and, and ministers, but, but 
all of the other groups that you would expect. And I've reflected on why that is. And I've put to you, uh, I suppose it's speculation, or at least uh, it, it's a reasonable thesis. And that is, I, after I came in, I so quickly announced a scheme to provide financial assistance that during my period of office, the whole of the concentration appeared to have moved to that. People arguing whether it was right or wrong, who should be eligible, why weren't dependents covered, and so on. So, and, and the submissions I was receiving were almost exclusively on those issues. And therefore, to me, if you ask me, well, why don't you declare a public inquiry? I say, well, I didn't see evidence, but I can now add to it, having read all the documents you sent to me, and there was no real demand of me. Now, perhaps Melanie Johnson's uh, bag was full of it, but I've got Andy Kerr, who's writing to me, on a subject he raised on the margins of another meeting entirely. Um, but you're just about to undermine me by reading out all these documents. No, 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 no. no. Um, Lord Reed, um, in, in terms of any formal submission to you, I, I don't think there is anything that formally um, um, sets out the case for and against a public inquiry. There are, I think, occasional references in the materials to public no, but, inquiry, but... Um, can, can, can I just clarify yeah. this? Because I'm, you know, we're not going to dispute. There are references in the materials which are briefing documents uh, which give 20 things you might be asked about. And one of those is a public inquiry. As far as the letters representations to me are concerned, so far as I can see from all the documentation, there, were, there was no such demand. And incidentally, in the briefing documents, the interesting thing is that from the beginning to the end of my term, that item on the briefing documents, including to Lord Warren on the House of Lords, which is about uh, public inquiries, drops further and further down in priority. In fact, in one of them, it comes at 21, I think, of the various things they make me ask about. Now, that's not scientific evidence, but it's indicative of the fact that throughout the period I was there, I believe the demands for public inquiry seem to lessen. And I'm drawing the conclusion, perhaps wrongly, that the reason is that the concentration was going on the scheme and less in public inquiry. Now, since then, it may have come, come back again. Um, I can't speak to that because I haven't been following it since, since I left. Uh, your, your letter to um, Andy Kerr at, um, back at, so it's the previous document we had, so uh, DHSC 62647333. Um, re records in the penultimate paragraph um, that you're aware of pressure from some people for the government to set up a public inquiry and yeah. says in terms we've considered the call for an inquiry very carefully um, is, that, is that really right that, that there was very careful consideration of the call for an inquiry because that's not necessarily consistent with the, the, the evidence you've ju just given Lord Reid that it didn't really come in any serious way across yeah. your desk well, when I say we have, we have considered it, it obviously had been considered over a period of 20 odd years. Um, so that's a, an element of, of seriousness, certainly, the consistency of consideration. As far as I was concerned, I've set out my statement, my personal views. This is a, me writing as Secretary of State. Um, my personal views were I did not at the time see any prima facie evidence that there had been willful um, or willful wrongdoing or negligence. I, di I didn't see it then. Now, I've no idea what happened since then. I have no idea 
personally, why Theresa, you know, what, what was the basis on which, what is the new evidence on which Theresa May made her decision to set up a public inquiry? I don't question it. I look forward to the lessons we can learn from it. Um, but I just don't know. But when I was there, I, I couldn't see any evidence for it. And the point I was making today, which is maybe superfluous, but I didn't appear on reading the documents you've sent me, many of them, I don't appear to have been under pressure to do it either. I hope that explains. Right. Um, in relation to hepatitis C financial assistance, you'd obviously over, you, you came in and changed a long-standing departmental line. Yes. Um, and I'm sure it wasn't always welcomed by my predecessors any more than the changes I brought into the Home Office. You know, but sometimes you have to take these decisions. It's the right thing to do. I mean, when I declared that the Immigration and Nationality Department wasn't fit for purpose, I mean, my friends, David Blunkett and Charles Clark, weren't best pleased. Um, it was no criticism of them. It was a political judgment, and a political judgment because, you know, all politicians are human beings. A political judgment can differ. But in the same way that you you questioned the, 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 the line to take in relation to financial assistance, did it occur to you to question the long-established line to take in relation to a public inquiry, which was one wasn't justified, there was no wrongdoing, and to call for, for a briefing about the pros and cons um, of calling a public inquiry? No, there was, there's no reason to do so, because I wasn't receiving lots of representations on it. Uh, if I had received a letter, look, you know, if, if somebody had come to me uh, at my surgery locally, if somebody had written me a letter, um, of course it may not get through to me, I accept that, but if it had been brought to my attention that there was evidence that I, as an unqualified non-lawyer, thought there's something, not just something awful here, because what happened, happened with hepatitis C was awful, um, but there's something wrong about this, then I wouldn't, in principle, be against the public inquiry. I mean, the chairman may know, given his background, when I was Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, we agreed to set up, I think, five inquiries. Now, they weren't public inquiries under the 2005 Act, but they were certainly set up judge-led inquiries, and the judge had the option of coming back to us uh, and saying, no, we want this, we're not getting enough assistance on this, we want this as full public inquiry. So I, I had nothing in principle against it. But in each of those cases where we set it up, in Northern Ireland when I was Secretary of State, that there was A, political pressure to do so, and secondly, there was prima facie evidence that something wrong had happened. I, I, in the absence of that, I, of, of those two items, I, I'm afraid I'd, I can't speak for those before me or after me, but, but I didn't think a public inquiry was merited. Just, just one last question on the issue of public inquiry. Um, you, you've articulated what might be said to be quite a high threshold for a public inquiry, so prima facie case of wrongdoing, negligence, etc. And you referred a moment or two ago to the, the Inquiries Act, which although it came into force just after you left office, yes. um, I think in early June 2005, would obviously have been going through Parliament whilst you were still in office. It received royal assent on the... 7th of April 2005. Now that sets a different test for a public inquiry, which is where it appears there's public concern that particular events may have occurred or that particular events have caused or are capable of causing public concern. Yes. Um, there's no evidence of any submission being made to you that you should think about a public inquiry in those terms. Mm. But do you, did it occur to you to, at any point to, to, to think about it in terms of this threshold that was going to be soon become law? <coughs> well, I, I know I'm being repetitive, but I wasn't aware 
of the public concern in, in the specific terms of people writing to me asking for a public inquiry, and, and I'm happy to be proved wrong and be corrected by that. Oh, you've got the documentation as well as I have, but my reading of it, it just wasn't there, not only from officials and from ministers, but from the party groups who were dealing with this specific issue. So, I mean, you're right that the 2005 Act hadn't passed, but even if it had it done, how else was I to judge public concern if the public weren't telling me they were concerned? That, that's, I hope that doesn't suit, sound trite, but it's... Um, I've just got one last um, area I want to explore with just, you. Just, just before we, we go there, can, can I just ask one question, because I want to be, be clear about this. Can we go back to putting on the screen DHSC 6264733? It's the, the Andy Care um, correspondence. This, this is uh, over your signature. Yes. Uh, and the penultimate paragraph begins with, I am aware of pressure from some people yes. for the government to set up a public inquiry into yes. this issue. Now, no one had written to you saying, please set up a public inquiry. No. But what, what were you speaking of? What pressure from some people to set up a public inquiry did you have in mind? Can you recall? Yes, when you were... I, I think I could recall. And that's Andy Kerr had told me. You see, this letter was in response, I think, uh, to a letter from Andy Kerr, who I had met, I don't know whether it was arranged officially or I'd met him somewhere at a gathering of some sort, and he had raised, the, the subject that he'd raised, if, if we could possibly go back to the full letter again, the subject he had raised, yes, it's following our meeting on 23rd of March. I'm afraid... Uh, Sir Brian, I can't remember what the meeting was about, but we obviously met on the 23rd of March, um, and the main reason we were meeting was about his concerns that the fund, and I mentioned earlier most, most of the representations I received uh, during my period on this subject were about the fund, uh, his main concern was that the fund was not operating smoothly. That's my recollection of it. But in the margins of his main concern, he mentioned to me that some people were uh, asking him for a public inquiry. And so when I responded to him, I said, I, I'm aware of pressure from some people for the government to set up a public inquiry. Does that answer your question? Well, it, it's, um, it, it's your answer. Um, into this issue, now this issue is the issue of what, the establishment of the scheme, or is it more general? Sorry, can I ask you to... Yes, it's the first sentence of the penultimate paragraph. Pressure from some people for the government to set up a public inquiry into this issue. That suggests it's a reference back to what else is in the letter. No, it's, it's a reference to a public inquiry. Into this issue, the issue is sorry. Is, is what, what I'm, yeah, what I'm asking the issue about. is head, sorry. Beg your pardon. The issue is what goes before, is it? Yes. The the, the, the issue is hepatitis C, as I understand the way. Hepatitis C, as opposed to the question of compensation payments and the way they're being administered. Um, can I see the letter again? Thank you. Yes, it's, I, I take entirely your point. It's, 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 it appears to refer to um, the construction of the scheme, a public inquiry into those issues mentioned in the first three paragraphs. But uh, I'm pretty certain from memory, although it's only in memory, that actually what he had mentioned to me is the history of the treatment for hemophiliacs and others 
which gave rise to the hepatitis C in the first place. Well, that, that would fit with the, the next two sentences if you just look at them. Yeah. Because um, with, we have great sympathy for those infected with hepatitis C and have considered the call for an inquiry very carefully. That, that looks as though it's looking at the infection or the cause of the infection or responsibility for the infection. And then, however, as previously stated, the government doesn't accept that any wrongful practices were employed. That almost certainly appears to be a reference to the infection and why it occurred, as opposed to the scheme and how it's been administered. Absolutely. I mean, I entirely accept that the, in terms of semantics, in terms of meaning, and in terms of, of, of uh, logical argument, the first sentence of there is badly phrased in appearing to refer backwards to the scheme rather than what was meant, which is a public inquiry into the general uh, question of how hepatitis C came to be uh, as a result of uh, the NHS. Thank you. I don't know if anything further arises out of that. Uh, uh, only that um, I probably should have gone to, and I will now go to, the the, um, the submission that Lord Reid refers to in his statement, which led to the letter being written, because it, it doesn't cast a huge amount of further light on the matter, but it costs a little. It's DHSC 5123255. It's the 29th of March 2005 from Gerard Hetherington to Helena Feinstein, who I think was in your private office. She was the private secretary who increasingly dealt with the question of uh, the questions we've been discussing today. And then we can see it refers um, to you having met with Andy Kerr on the 23rd of March and you've requested an update on progress. Um, and then um, there is uh, um, a line to take, which is about progress with the scheme. Yeah. And under that uh, heading line to take the end of the paragraph says I attach a short letter for Secretary of State to send to Andy Kerr at Annex B. Then under the heading background, um, the first two paragraphs deal solely with the issue about the, the Skipton Fund. The third paragraph then says, Scottish colleagues continue to be lobbied hard by the Scottish uh. Haemophilia Forum for a more generous and extended scheme, e.g. they would like it to cover dependents, and they are pressing hard for a public inquiry in Scotland. And then the next paragraph, the Smoking, Health and Social Care Scotland Bill is going through the Scottish Parliament. Um, as it contains a clause on the fund, SHF has submitted oral evidence, taking the opportunity to reopen the debate and ask for a public inquiry. Um, and then it says there is therefore some pressure in Scotland for rapid progress. I suspect this is why Andrew Kerr has raised this, raised this with the Secretary of State at this stage. And then the conclusion... First paragraph again deals with the set of the Skipton Fund. And then the second and third paragraphs essentially reflect what we see in the letter that Lord Reid sent. Um, yes. So um, uh, there is expressed reference there to pressures uh, for a public inquiry from groups in Scotland. And, and that, that, I think, is the background to the letter that's then, um, that we've just been looking Thank at. Thank you. That, that's, that's very helpful. I'm sorry I failed to recall that. Um, so, the, so I'm conscious we're going into the lunchtime, but I've only got one further question, really, that I want to ask Lord Reid. Um, and so if I could do that, and then we take the lunch break, and call participants can suggest any further questions during lunch. It, it's really a, a general question, Lord Reid, and it goes back to this idea of long-standing policies, long-standing lines to, to take. And some of the evidence the inquiry has heard has talked about the idea of... Um, officials or officials and ministers developing a mindset um, the phrase group think has been used and also the idea of institutional resistance to, to changing established lines do, do you have any observations either on that those ideas in, and, and the extent to which you saw that within the Department of Health or indeed other government departments and also any ways of trying to overcome that or address that as as, a, as problems within government? Um, I, I think I alluded to this earlier on. Um, forgive me if I repeat myself, but I think I said that 
if we're talking here about civil servants. And first of all, before we get to civil servants, there's a tendency in all organisations towards groupthink. I'm not sure what it's like among lawyers, but certainly in political parties and uh, other organisations, bigger ones, yes, there's always a tendency towards that. So, I mean, the idea of constant renewal, which I'm familiar with because it was the centre of a very successful uh, Labour campaign to win government, that idea is, has to be fostered and a critical mind taken um, to inherited positions. Let's agree that, that, that that's a good thing to happen. As regards the civil service, my experience is the civil service dislike two types of ministers. The first is the minister who has no idea what he or she wants to do. And secondly, the minister who knows what they want to do and won't listen to anyone about the potential consequences of what they want to do. In that context, assuming a minister knows what he or she wants to do and is prepared to show a degree of leadership, it is not only right, but a responsibility of the civil service to point out to the minister the consequences, perhaps unintended consequences, of the course of action that they wish to pursue. It is also the responsibility of the civil service to defend the political line set by the political leadership until the political leadership wishes to change it. That's putting it rather crudely, but that's the case. Now, either the warning about consequentials or the defence of an existing line can be seen as, or caricatured as, an institutional <coughs> obstacle to change. If you're asking me if, if that's my experience in government, the answer is no. My experience in government is that civil servants both question and outline the unintended consequences of what you're about to do, and they tend to defend the existing position, which could be called groupthink. But if a leader, and that's what Secretary of State is supposed to be, cabinet members, if a leader has the vision and the character and the capability to take through a change, the civil service will then change the line to take and will act without resistance, provided what you're doing is legal. And my experience in the departments I've been in suggests that they will do that and do it loyally. And that includes, incidentally, chiefs of staff of the defence forces, who may or may not share my view, um, but they and the top civil servants that I work with uh, I have always found are prepared, once you have made up your mind, provided you've listened to them, and you say, no, this is the way we're going. And in conclusion, all I would say is I would point to evidence today of, you know, the man who's burdened with a lot of this, Mr. Gatowski. There he was up until the 13th of June, when I arrived unexpectedly on the scene, saying, no, this is the line. We, we can't do this. This is the way we've done things all this time, you know. For the last 20 years, we've been consistent on this. And by the 23rd of June, is running about trying to arrange a complete reversal of the policy that he's loyally supported. Why? Because the, politically, the democratically elected political leadership decided on a different course of action. And I think... You know, I, I'm sorry to, to name him, but it's just because he, he's come up today. I think that's an illustration of my experience of civil servants in government. And would it follow from what you've said 
that it's an important part of the role of ministers, especially, but not only the Secretary of State, to be prepared to, to question, to probe, to in interrogate in a politely the, the material with which they're provided. Yes. And to look at things with an open mind and a, often with a, as a, through a fresh pair of eyes. Yes, I, I, I think that's true. Um, I mean, I'm not suggesting that ministers are any different from any other human being. Their, their time is limited. Uh, the pressure's on them to uh, work for today's project and tomorrow's project are huge. Their capacity to carry out historical investigations, personally, is limited. They're relying on officials to do that. So there, there are great deficiencies. But, but yes, I would agree with you. It is the, the role of, of leadership to, to question, to scrutinize, to think about what you've been told by others, to be open to that, uh, but certainly to, to try and make sure that the course of action you're taking avoids the unintended consequences that may be brought to you. I don't know whether mine did or not, but... <coughs> so those are the questions I'm proposing to ask Lord Reid, and I'm sorry to have eaten into everyone's lunch break. If we could take a break for lunch, during which core participants through their legal representatives can suggest any further lines of question, I don't anticipate when we return being very much further with Lord Reid. I would hope 15 minutes would be sufficient, and then, of course, we need to get on with, to the evidence of Ms Blears. Yes. Um, let me uh, explain. You, you may Let me explain. You may already know that it, there are a, a very large number of core participants in this inquiry, many of whom are represented by legal representatives. They have a right under the Act to put questions through counsel uh, to uh, a witness. Um, plainly, they have to be given an opportunity to formulate those questions because uh, they haven't, they until n just now, uh, heard what you had to say this morning. Um, and to give them an opportunity, we normally take a break. That break will be lunch. It means that I won't set a, an absolute time. I will say not before ten past two for a turn, because it may be, uh, I doubt it, but it may be that Council will have some more questions coming through and needs a little bit, for, bit, bit more time, in which case you will be told. So not before ten past two, uh, and... Uh, some short while after that, I don't know how long, uh, we, we shall be able to uh, let you go and, and uh, hear from uh, Ms. Blears. Thank you, sir. Not before ten past two. <laughs>